Welcome to the Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. Larry is the author of over 40 books, the founder of Dove International, a worldwide family of churches and ministries in six continents, and has over 50 years of leadership experience. He and his guests will share inspirational leadership insights from their journey with God. These insights, gleaned from serving leaders in many nations, will transform your life and leadership. For more information on Larry's books and resources, visit LarryKreider.com. Larry Carter here with the Larry Carter Leadership Podcast. Again, this week with me in the studio is my friend for many years, Josh Good. Welcome. Hey, Larry. It's good to be here again and <laughs> again, excited again. for our conversation today. We're going to focus on revival today and we're looking forward to that. Uh, for those of you who do not know Josh, Josh has served for last years as a youth pastor at Westgate Church. He served on the WSA youth team, leading that team for working with youth pastors all over the USA. Right now in the process of working with a friend, entrepreneurial friend, starting a brand new business. So yeah. you got a lot, a lot of things on the fire right now. Yeah, lots going on right now. Well, I know you're in your heart of hearts. We've talked about this many times. Yeah. You have such a heart for revival. And we've had these discussions. We prayed together. Yeah. Uh, not the first time you've been on this podcast. And so I know you've studied revivals, and of course, I've got a heart for revivals. Yeah. I've studied revivals also. But I just want you to share with us today, you know, obviously revivals need leadership, but with the leadership of the Holy Spirit is yeah. the most important thing. But talk to us about what you've learned about revival and even what you've experienced yeah. to this point. Yeah, well, I would certainly not call myself an expert on revival, but right. I would say I felt a tug in my heart mm-hmm. towards revival and have been so inspired by just revival history as I've dug into it. And no doubt there's many listening that know much more intricacies and details than sure. I do. But I've, I'm excited to just have a discussion about this, Larry, because this is something you and I have really connected on yes. over the past multiple years. Mm-hmm. Just I know it's been a, a, a touch point for your own heart. Sure I remember asking you what's your favorite book, and yeah. you said... Revival Lectures by Charles Finney, and, and, and next to the Bible. Yeah, next to the and Bible. that was soon after we met. I said, you know, Larry, what's your favorite book? Um, what, what's one, one book you'd recommend? And you said that. And um, caused me to buy that book and read that book and be convicted the entire time I read it. But what an incredible... What, what did you learn from that book? Do you remember anything you well, learned from Well, I book? remember uh, Charles Finney. If you open up that book, it's incredible. Just the, like you said, Charles Finney's a lawyer. Yeah. And he kind of just lays out, this is, this is how revival works. Yeah. And it kind of strikes you like, this is how revival works. It's a move of God's spirit. But Charles Finney would say that God's heart is for revival. And so in the same way that a farmer goes out to plow the fields and plant the seed, he is expectant for rain because the ground naturally produces fruit or vegetables or whatever the seed is that's planted. And he said, how much more can we trust that God will bring revival as we faithfully, you know, tear up the ground and sow the seed? And that really stuck with me that God's heart is for revival. I remember years ago, I was speaking at a church in Rochester, New York. Wow. And they said to me, do you know Charles Finney was here? I said, really? And they took me to the room, the pulpit that he stood behind in Rochester, New York. And I remember the stories, you know, in that part of New York, uh, his friend Father Nash. Remember that name? Yeah, yeah. Father Nash was the prayer boy. He'd go and pray for weeks, right. sometimes months, and just get a room in a hotel or whatever, and just pray and pray and pray and pray. And one time, I remember the story that Finney was coming to town, went over the bridge to go into this town in upstate New York, and the presence of God just fell on the yeah. town. And, and Josh, people in factories, right. weren't, they stopped working. They were just under the presence of God. They were convicted of right. sin, crying out to God. I mean, it was amazing. It's kind of yeah. revival. I mean, I've seen some kind of semi-revival, you know, some yeah. revival, but nothing like that. Right. And that was Charles Finney and a real key for him. Obviously, it's very yeah. practical in the book, but yeah. he was Father Nash. It's something you always say, but the story behind the story, That's you know, right. and I love that when you dig into the revival history and you see what kind of groundwork was laid in prayer by yeah. countless men and women yeah. who are unnamed you know, usually right. there's one or two or three names right. named in the revival itself, but so many men and women that so often just pioneer in faith for years, maybe decades before there's this great outpouring. I love learning about that as well. Father Nash is one of those yeah. that just took the background um, for Charles Finney's ministry. And um, yeah, I was I was listening back this morning even on a number of 
you know, I, there's a revival history podcast I listen to. And I mean, just to use a reference for those listening, J. Edwin Orr is his name of this uh, historian. He's known as one of the foremost historians on revival from the 20th century. He's now passed, but you can look up his website and mm-hmm. he has all kinds of thorough research on the history of revival. Really solid stuff was a professor. Um, Andy Bird did a whole lecture on revival history that is very well done for, you know, the everyday ordinary believer. And I think it's worthwhile digging into because it's good. of what you gain from it. But um, I thought it would be good, Larry, if we just talked a little bit starting out on like, what is revival? Okay. Because it's it's become sort of this coin term. And Alyssa right. and I talk about this, like, you know, we toss out revival, we're praying for revival, we're believing for revival. You know, we say those things a lot, but what it, what is it actually that we're talking about? And I think it's so used that we can start to grow even numb to those sure. words. So what's the revival well, to you? I always go back to something I learned from Finney years ago, and that is re- I believe revival is a return of obedience to God. That's good. Yeah. You know, I mean, you read Finney's book, Revival Lectures book, in the one old chapter, you remember where you repent when you read through it. It's yeah. all these areas, you know, have you done this? Have you done this? Have you yeah. thought this? You know, sins of omission, I mean, on and on and on. Mm-hmm. And it's really a return in our hearts of being obedient to God. That's how I see it. I mean, awakening, when there's an awakening, it's really an area, a town, a city, a nation, whatever. And when there's an awakening, you see people coming to Christ. Yeah. And this, that's how I see it. Yeah. Uh, and these words are used interchangeably. Usually refreshing is people just get refreshed by the Holy Spirit, yeah. refreshed by God. But true revival is when our hearts are turned toward God in a new way. Yeah, and so that could happen on a personal level, a uh, regional level, right? corporate, national worldwide level where our hearts are turned back to obedience and uh i think too it's the hope for revival is that it would get to a place of sustained obedience that we would like we don't want to go back to being dead right and so this place of sustained obedience as well well you know finney talks about that yeah finney says that you can't see need revival yeah. because the nature of man yeah. is to kind of n- n- totally backslide. Right. But the, you're in fire for God and fire for the presence of the Lord, fire for his, his purposes. And then things happen in life and slowly we edge away. Yeah. We still love Jesus. We edge away. And he says you need, at intervals in your life, you need fresh revivals right. to come. Personal revival and also corporate revival. Yeah, and I think it's it's not a testament to the power. It's... The, the need for continued revival is not a testament to the lack of God's power, but right. to the simple nature of man That's to correct. turn and go his own way. And um, so we see these outpourings, you know, throughout history, but man can't sustain it because right. of the nature of who he is. He turns towards idolatry or turn towards, you know, some other attentive thing, but... but this, this podcast obviously is a leadership podcast. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about... Leadership and revival. Yeah. You know, like, and I feel like what you've been involved in the last yeah. four or five months, the Jesus rallies here in Pennsylvania, it's not full fledged revival, but it's a, it's really touches on revival. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned before, there's always those people often unknown who are praying behind the scenes. Yeah. That's part of the leadership of that. Yeah. Uh, I find God, God honors, honors leaders working together in unity. He commands blessings, Psalm 133. Yeah. Um, so I think it's a lot. Leadership is a lot behind the scenes too, yeah. building relationship and praying and honoring, and preferring and honoring others. You might see things differently than we do, but our heart is Jesus. Mm-hmm. We want to see that, that knowledge of the glory of the Lord cover the earth as the world is covered the yeah. sea. What are your thoughts? Well, I'll, I'll, I'd like to share maybe from my own personal please, experience because um, a lot of my passion for, for revival comes from some of the stirring of the Lord's voice in my own life that He would desire to bring revival to this region. I've shared before on this podcast, I think, but I never planned on being in church ministry or right. youth ministry at all, really, for that matter. And God kind of supernaturally called me back to Lancaster. It's a long story I won't right. get into. I found myself in Lancaster being a youth pastor and saying, God, what on earth am I doing here? And I remember, you know, sitting in in Dove Leadership School one day and Sam Smucker, a pastor from the Worship Center, was sharing about his experience and how God called him to Lancaster County. And I forget, you know, they were, they grew up in Lancaster, they were in some other state and God called them back to plant a church. And he said he felt called to stay at that church serving for 40 years. 
And it was kind of in that moment where I felt God highlight to me the reality that Sam was called for 40 years. And that was, I think, his last year, or maybe it was his first year of retirement. So Worship Center had been 40 years. The outpouring that Dove had experienced in Rama Youth Ministry yeah. had happened 40 years prior in Dude. 1979. Right. HarvestNet had planted, I think it was 39 years ago at that point. And then Petra Church was right there with you. And, and the Hope One Network. Yeah. And it was kind of all came crashing down in that one moment in that one classroom. And I started scribbling things down that the Lord was showing me. Hmm. And I realized, you know, 40 years is a really significant number in the Bible of, you know, a generation. And felt like God, you know, it wasn't an audible voice, but just this strong sense that, God, you're about to do something in the youth. You're about to do something in this region. Uh, an outpouring mm. like you did 40 years ago in right. 1979 in that time frame of charismatic renewal, Jesus movement. I wasn't there. I wasn't alive. Right. But I, I've, my personal family has been so impacted by that outpouring. Mm -hmm. And in that time frame, my grandparents coming to genuine faith in that time period, I knew the, the genuine impact that that had on society right, right. and on a generation of people, your generation, right. really, when you guys were about my age. And I felt this faith just well up inside of me, God, you know, you, you you would do it again and you could do it again. And that sort of was just an alone type of encounter with God where I started carrying faith in my heart that God would bring revival to this region. And maybe this is why he called me here to pioneer for that kind of mm. move. Um, and it was in the midst of kind of praying and saying, God, OK, you know, I have a sense of vision now. I have a sense of direction as to maybe why I'm here and an expectation. And so I, you know, began just sharing that vision with others. And just, I think through God's sovereignty was led to a now friend of mine, Oliver Denlinger, who's a youth pastor at Africa Community Church, part of HarvestNet, planted 40 years ago. I'm about the same age. And I start sharing with him, you know, what God's doing to me. And he's like, man, I feel the same thing, the exact same thing. Amazing. You know, we're sharing about he's sensing this, I'm sensing this. And we said, you know, let's just start praying together yeah. on Friday mornings. That's how it all starts. And so that was as simple as that. And I'm not saying that it was only us. Right. I of saw course. God bringing people into the county from multiple spheres of influence. Like you'd meet people. Yeah, we're not sure why, but God called us here. You know, we're not sure why, but God called us here. I felt like I was meeting people like that on a monthly basis um, who were just like, yeah, we're just expectant. And but Oliver and I started praying together. And then there was a few other youth pastors that we kind of connected with, and we began praying together. And out of that time, a vision was shared by actually a Dove pastor named Lita Matos mm -hmm. that he had about revival coming to Ephrata School District. And he's from Massachusetts. And he's from Massachusetts. Yeah. So this was so out of left field. He wrote it down, he emailed it to me, and I just blasted it out to those youth pastors that I prayed with. And to this day, I've never seen a prophetic word or vision or how that that email, that written word that he wrote and sensed, I never seen a word like that catch the wind and just inspire so much faith. I've seen that word shared publicly. I don't know, probably over a fifteen to twenty times. Yeah. Um, to the youth, corporately in churches, um, across denominations. At one point uh, in twenty nineteen, we were in effort of high school and shared the word with the principal Scott Galen. And then got to pray with him that we would see it come to pass. And it, it kind of just inspired us to start pressing in, praying. And uh, out of that, I mean, that's what we've seen happen over the past multiple years of these gatherings of youth of 300, 400, 500. And then this summer, you know, in the thousands yep. um, of students just hungry for God. And we saw salvations and baptisms. Amazing. And I wouldn't say that it was at the measure that you read about in the history books where you're seeing hundreds of thousands come to faith and, um, you know, these these radical, uh, like, stories, which we can share about more later. I have some fun ones I kind of wanted to share I love today. how you do that. Yeah. But, uh, but the first fruits, you know, and that's yeah. what it's felt like, the first fruits of student, like just yesterday, we were praying again. As youth pastors got together, we started praying. Oliver was like, I want to share a testimony. I got a text this morning of a ninth grade girl, 14 years old, was in class, was talking to a girl about the Lord and said, you know, have you ever heard the gospel? And she said, no. She shared the gospel with her. 
And she said, you know, do you want to receive Christ right now? And she said, yes. Led Beautiful. this girl to the Lord, you know, right there Beautiful. as a 14-year-old. And to me, that's long been my prayer. I, I love corporate gatherings. Mm-hmm. I love, you know, worshiping together. But my heart is to see it go on a peer-to-peer level right. across the schools. That's when, I, that to me, I just feel like when, when it gets to that level, there's no stopping it. You know, when students grab a hold of the gospel, they start sharing it peer-to-peer in their schools. You know, that's when we'll know we've really entered into yeah. something powerful. And yeah. that was such an encouragement just yesterday. Of, uh, so Finney, obviously, you know, he talks yeah. about revivals. There's certain things you can do. Obviously, God brings revival, but there's certain yeah. things we need to do. And he says, don't just say, well, we, we just pray. Yeah. We, we do pray, and that's an important thing. If anybody understood that, he understood that. Yeah. Uh, but he said there's some other things. We're talking about leadership here. So uh, some things you did is you met with others to pray, shared the vision, shared that heart. Uh, are there any other things that, it, from the leadership perspective, that you feel like if someone says, I've got such a heart for revival for my city, for my nation, and I'm living in Liberia, I'm living yeah. in you know Germany, in Canada, USA, whatever, uh, what are things that we can do or should do and that could potentially... Yeah ignite a fire in God. Well, in some ways, I would go back to your fields of ministry, Larry, and, and how you teach on that. And going back to the field analogy from Charles Finney, what's the field that God's called That's you good. to? And what can you do inside of that field? So if you yeah. lead a small group, mm-hmm. are you believing for revival in your small Beautiful. group? Beautiful. If you lead a church body, you know, how are you plowing the ground, sowing seed for revival mm. in your field? And you have to start there. You can't get beyond that. You know, if you're just if you're just not leading anything currently, how are you stewarding revival in your own life and yes. living that out personally in your family? Yes. Yes. I think that that has to start there. Um, you know, I looked at what was in, in my hands, and I'm not saying I was perfect. I certainly wasn't, and there's lots I, I would, could do differently. But I looked at my own hands, you know, four years ago and thought, okay, God, you've called me to the youth in Lancaster County. Right. And so that's where I'm going to pioneer. That's where I'm going to plow. That's where I'm going to you know, sow seed and believe for. And that's why I started praying with youth pastors because mm-hmm. that was the sphere of influence that God called me to. So I think it, it starts there. Yes. And you carry that faith. You know, if God's given you that measure of faith for revival in your region, you start with what's in my hands, you know, present that to God, start praying with that field, like for revival in that field and watch how God will bring the connections from there. Correct. And beyond that, I think the, I think the most, the, the, most important thing to do is to hold on to that faith. Yeah. I think faith is yeah. faith is the most significant thing that you can do. And that faith will propel you then to action. Right. And so that's why we held worship gatherings with the students that we currently had in our youth groups. And they began experiencing God's presence in a new way. And they began praying for one another. You know, and then Joel Bomberger moved back to the area and he was such a catalyst. A lot of people, you know, he he received a prophetic word that he was a spark plug. So we were praying for years, but Joel coming back was almost mm-hmm. like the spark plug in that engine that we right. needed to really see something ignite because of the evangelistic call and anointing that he carries to gather and to share the gospel and the power that comes from him sharing. And so um, I think that's some of the practical things that we personally did. You got to look at where am I called right now? I saw something else that you did. I thought yeah. it was really important. And that was, there, you know, those gatherings for the summer, the Jesus rallies, as they were called, and I was there for as many, many of those nights as I could be, uh, were not just youth. It was all led by youth yeah. and yet led by, say, youth, you know, 20s probably yeah. in mostly. But there was a real honoring of the generation. There was an older generation there mm-hmm. honoring the younger, saying, we're going to stay out of the way. Because every move of God, every generation of revival, it does look a bit different. Yeah. Because I've, I've now lived through three. That I, I, the one you mentioned already, it was during the Jesus Movement, and yeah. we had the Ramey Youth Ministries, and there were other Bible studies. There were just hundreds and hundreds of young people getting right with God, coming under the Lordship of Christ, yeah. being baptized in Spirit. And out of that, new churches started here in this region. Yeah. That's one. The second was probably about 14 years ago, I'm guessing. It was called TBS, Tuesday Bible yep. Study. 
and um, the Stoltzfus brothers and a bunch of others came out of YWAM and said, well, God did some powerful things when we were in YWAM at different bases. And couldn't we see God do something among the, the youth here? I mean, that was amazing, too, because they had a heart to submit to leadership in the area. Yeah. And leadership weren't trying to control them, but release right. them. And there was up to like 1,300 young people coming to some of the largest church buildings in our area week after week. TBS, Tuesday Bible study, yeah. very simplistic. But I still meet people and say, I got right with God through Tuesday Bible yeah. study. There was something the Holy Spirit was doing. It was for a season, yeah. and it was powerful. But then I see God doing this thing here right now, yeah. you know, with you and others. And I say, well, God, you're doing this thing again. It's, yeah. It is awesome. And they were all a bit different, but there was this honoring of generations that I think was really powerful yeah. that you haven't always seen in the past. Yeah, well, like, you know, I'm 28, so I have only lived through what I would say is maybe the beginning of one of those. Right. Right. So I haven't tasted or seen others, but I've always felt, you know, in this call towards stewarding, you know, yes. m- revival or whatever that looks like, that I don't know what I'm doing, you know, like a real dependence on the Lord, which I, right. I love. Sure. And out of that place, I'm like, Larry, you know, you've experienced this three times or Ron, you've experienced right. this three times. Like, man, I think for anyone feeling this draw on their own hearts to steward revival in their region... We need to have honor towards those that have gone before us, even if the practices aren't the exact same or the thought patterns right. aren't the exact right. same. Man, when we can honor, and, and that's what we saw this summer, it was it was truly incredible that the leaders, the senior pastors, and even the apostolic fathers and mothers of the faith would come to those gatherings and they'd allow 20-somethings to lead those. That takes so much humility from the older generation. And we felt that. Mm -hmm. And we just wanted to reflect honor back to the older generation and recognize that it wouldn't have happened the way that it did if it wasn't for just a mutual honoring between the two. And it is a two-way street. And we've talked about that before in the generations and that Mm -hmm. the older generation Maybe they're listening to this podcast and they have some young, zealous leader. And can you father or mother them in such a way where they can grow up into what God has for them? And just a a real culture of release here in Dove, I know from living in it the past few years, Mm -hmm. um, to go after what God has placed in your heart to go after. I think it's so key. What what I share with my generation and a generation after me, you're a couple of generations after me, (laughs) is that, you know, every move of God is different. And we've got to be really careful because historically, when there's a move of God, often the leaders of that move of God will persecute the next move of God yeah. because it's different yeah. and because it's not going to be the same. And uh, always challenge leaders, you know, my age and next generation younger, that let's not persecute the next move of God. Let's get behind. Let's get yeah. let's get under the next the next generation as they see this move of God. And I know it's got to be so difficult because you know you're watching us. Well, we would Go do things for differently, it. probably. Exactly, and you're yeah. thinking, I probably wouldn't do it that way. <laughs> but one thing I, I just would say to those listening, Larry, in our talks about what's going on, rarely, if ever, have I ever heard you say, I would do it this way. It's been more of a, hey, I don't want to put Saul's armor on you. Right. That's been your key right. key phrase is, hey, we don't want to put Saul's armor on you. We want to trust you to go after what mm. God has in your heart. How can I pray for you? How can I support you? This is what the Word of God says about this. This right. is what we've experienced, but never, I would do it this way. And that yeah. well, that's encouraging for us a, to hear. That's our heart to do that. I mean, it was a powerful, but, we, but it's got to be hard to do. I mean, it's yeah, got to take a ton yeah. of humility. <laughs> yeah. Well, and again, to do it the way we would do it might feel right to us, but it wouldn't be right because <laughs> it's another generation. Yeah. And God's, you know, moving through you. Yeah. So powerful. You know, I, I've, you know, one of the books that I had written some years ago was Building a Person House of Prayer. And I have a whole chapter in the back on New yeah. Bible, lots of stories, but, you know, revival, you know, from not only our nation here, uh, but, you know, the Finney revivals on and on, you know. But uh, I would like you, because you studied revival, and you said you've got some stories of revival. Yeah. I'd like to hear those. Yeah, so a couple of, like, I mean, there's so many, but they build so much faith inside of me. And I would encourage anybody to go back, listen to Annie Bird's, it's called Commission the City, that whole lecture series. I think every Christian should know the history of the faith. So many times we know the Bible up to Revelation, which is massively important, and that takes precedence, obviously. But to know the history of how we got to where we're at right now, 
it is shocking how much revival has played a part like in seasons of incredible darkness wow. god springs forth of the light and it kind of carries forth the next generation so many of us are christians today because of what happened in That's the right. first great awakening mm-hmm. second great awakening mm-hmm. you know the moves of god with billy graham so anyway a couple stories that just even struck out to me reviewing this morning is from the welsh revival mm-hmm. um it, it's amazing that one of the unexpected um setbacks that the revival caused is that the miners uh the mules no longer recognized their voice because they would cuss at them so much right and it shut down work in the mines because the miners got filled with the spirit of god and came to salvation they'd come back down to the mines and they wouldn't cuss anymore that's amazing and so the mules stopped pulling yeah and so the mine had to be shut down until the mules could be retrained another story is from uh the prayer revival in new york that was started i believe his name's jeremiah lamphere yep incredible you know he prints out sixty thousand pamphlets for this prayer meeting he's a business guy in faith he's just like (laughs) i need to start a prayer meeting yeah passes all these out no one shows up to the first prayer meeting like that's in i i want to say like there's no printers like he is getting those I don't even know how you go about it, but it's not as easy as just going on your computer and hitting 60,000 print. You know, he must have spent an immaculate amount of time and energy, passes all those out, and no one shows up. He just starts praying. By the end of that meeting, six guys showed up. Wow. They prayed. They met again the next week. Started to multiply. Starts to multiply. Starts to become an everyday prayer meeting. They overflow their current meeting space, have to go to another church. Pretty soon. I mean, I don't know. I I'd have to review the exact timeline, but I want to say it was within months that in New York City, at the lunch hour, shops would be closing down to go to the prayer meeting. Or you'd look outside the window and you'd see the factories, people running to the nearest prayer meeting to get there because of the way that God's Spirit was moving so strongly. And during that prayer meeting, it was said that people, like sailors, would come in on ships to the ports. And as they were sailing in, you know, they're living very immoral lifestyles. Right. They'd come under the conviction of sin and just be bent onto the decks of the boats when they wow. entered into the port because of the conviction of sin was so strong. It's like stuff like that is like God. And, you know, that's what I'm hungry to see and, and witness. And every move of God is different. But, like, when you hear stories like that, it's so mm-hmm. moving and powerful. Um, you know, I think of... I, w- I was listening this morning about the Second Great Awakening. Yeah, tell me about that. It was said that... It was some of the darkest times. There was 5 million people in America, 300,000 of which were alcoholics. So I don't know what percentage that is of the population, but 15,000 people were dying from alcoholism a year. George Washington, you know, was quoted in saying that, like, we're having a major moral decline and he doesn't know what the solution is. Um, things were dark. Voltaire um, said that he believed that Christianity would be dead within 30 years. Yep. And so things were as dark as they had been in, 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 the colon, in, in America at that point. And we were now a nation. It was getting to the end of the 1700s. And out of that darkness, the Second Great Awakening springs forth. And that was a sustained kind of revival of about 40, 50 years with kind of three different waves involved, the end of which would have been Charles Finney. Right. And what people don't realize is how many of the institutions that still stand today were birthed out of those revivals. You know, hospitals and schools and social institutions that the Spirit of God came and moved upon society in such a way. And I don't know the exact numbers, but it was well north of 10% of the population was saved in that move of God. Wow. And out of that, you see, like, society really start to form in the nation and the interesting part then is the financial prosperity that came yeah. in. It was said out of that revival, people were receiving 18% returns on their investment year to year. And financial prosperity yep. led to the deterioration of right. that relationship with God. And so even inside of that, there's so much for us to learn. You know, God pours out mm-hmm. a spirit. He blesses his people. Yeah. And we see this in the Bible as well. And then we receive that prosperity that the Lord brings in those times of revival and refreshing. And initially, we're so overwhelmed with the joy of salvation. But over time, we you know 
just take up this apathy in our hearts. We trust, and we forget. We trust in the wealth and we trust in the blessing yeah. rather than God. Yeah. And so the pendulum swings again, you know, and it, it, it's happened throughout history. And we as people, it's it does us very well to study revival history because we can recognize those tendencies in our own heart. Yeah. As the pendulum can start to swing back, we need to remember, and I can't, I can't remember the verse right now, perhaps you can, about, you know, I think it's Moses who says, you know, when your vats are filled with wine, when your he right. lists right. off all these things, then Be careful. That you yeah, know. remember yeah. the Lord your God. That's right. And so, um, powerful things to learn yeah. throughout all of revival history. Uh, one last thing I'll say. This is very interesting. You know, one of the revival historians I listen to. If you look across revivals in America, at least, it's very fascinating that. Each revival tends to happen within five to ten years of a major war happening. Interesting. And it's obviously, you know, not a a perfect fact, but of each revival in America, there's been a war that's happened within five to ten years after. So, you know, um, the Second Great Awakening goes up till about 1840, and soon after is the Civil War. Civil War. Um, the First Great Awakening, very soon after is the Revolutionary War. Second Great Awakening, War of 1812. Um, mm-hmm. And it's just kind of fascinating to, to see that, you know, it seems like God would pour His Spirit out right before perhaps the hand of evil kind of falls upon mm-hmm. a society and many lives are lost mm-hmm. at a young age. So this is another interesting fact to just... Mm, interesting. Yeah, interesting tendency you see throughout history. Well, thanks for sharing with us, you know, Andy Bird's insights. Andy, we yeah. love Andy and his heart so much for revival. One of my favorite stats in revival is from 1858. In 1858, in Atlantic City, well, first of all, it, within about four months, the Methodists alone reported 10,000 conversions in Philadelphia. Yeah. That's just what happened in revivals. <laughs> and revival spread from Pennsylvania to New Jersey. Yeah. And here's the stat I love. In Atlantic City, not more than 50 unconverted people were reported to be remaining in a population of 60,000. 50. Wow. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. Yeah, and, and on and on. Well, we, we're running out of time. This has been so good, Josh. And you're, I love, you always stir me when we talk about revival, and I want to share that with our friends around the world. Yeah. I'd like you to pray. Again, we have people from dozens and dozens of nations, over 110 nations, who listen to this podcast. Yeah. And pray for the just for revival. Pray for those who have a heart for revival, yeah. and they know how to lead in their own lives, their own sphere of ministry, uh, to see revival come to their part of the world. Yeah. So I travel throughout the nations. I, everywhere I go, I find people hungry for revival. And if you'd pray, that that'd be an amazing blessing yeah. to our friends. Let me share real quick. You know what we're really standing for faith here, and I hope it stirs faith. You know, around the world as well, but. A friend of ours, Kevin Eshelman, who's a senior pastor of a local church, has shared this, in it, and we've really grabbed hold of it in faith in the region. Um, you know, he'd say historically, when when revival happens, about one third of the population comes to to salvation. And so he looked at you know our broader region, about a three county area, and said that amount is about two hundred thirty thousand people. So we've just started in faith, believing that Thank God would pour God. out salvation. 230,000 people come to salvation um, in the coming years, in the short term, um, that it would be a move of God, that we'd see salvations come. And for those around the world listening that, that feel that genuine call to steward and pray and um, plow for revival, you know, we're just believing with you. And standing in faith as brothers and sisters in the body of Christ, that the Lord does want to bring revival to your region, and He will do it. Mm. And so, just going to pray in faith um, for the encouragement necessary to Beautiful. keep pressing on and to not get discouraged. Mm. And so, uh, Lord, yes, Lord, we pray this morning, God, for those listening around the world, and God for ourselves as well, that we would hear Your voice clearly, yes, Lord for what you want to do specifically in your region. God, you are not a God that can be manipulated or we can't shrink you down into a formula, Lord. You are our Father. And so, Jesus, we ask that you would help us, God, to pre- pre- just in, our hu- in humility, God, prepare a vessel that you could fill, Lord, and pour out 
on our cultures and societies around the world, Lord God. We look at the times. We look at the news headlines. We look at the different spheres of society. And we see a genuine need for an outpouring of your spirit, God. Mm. Lord, without it, things will continue to divulge into darkness. And so, Lord, just out of a desperation of our hearts, God, we cry out, Lord, for you to pour out your spirit, Lord, Mm. to bring salvation to thousands and hundreds of thousands, God, around the world. And surely even this day, God, you are doing that. We are not praying this from a place of lack, but that you are actually doing this in multiple nations around the world, even as we speak right now, Jesus. Yes, Lord. We ask, God, that your spirit would be poured out in our nation, in America, in the nations of the world. And we just stand in faith with the whole body of Christ, Lord, that we need you. We are desperate for you, God. And when you do it, Father, we ask that we would remember and that we would walk in that sustained place of obedience, Lord Jesus, because you are the giver of life. Mm. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Josh, that was powerful. Thank you so much for being with me today and with us today. And I just want to mention for all those listening, if you want to avail yourself to some of the resources that we talked about here, check the show notes. It's all on the show notes, and we're believing together for revival in our day yeah. that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. So, Amen. Josh, good again. Thank you for joining us. It's been a Thanks great joy to have you on. And everyone, we'll see you again next week as we continue to learn those small things in leadership that make a major difference in our lives and the lives of those we serve through the Larry Carter Leadership Podcast. God bless you. Have an amazing week. Thank you for listening to Larry Kreider's Leadership Podcast. If you want more information about any of Larry's books, daily devotionals, small group resources, or any other teachings, go to LarryKreider.com.